Hello and welcome to the first edition of the Sloan Age podcast, in the tradition of naming things after puns on my own surname that was given to me by my father. Uh, I'm here for the Wolverhampton Society uh, with my first guest, the hospital historian and all-round general local legend, Mr Roy Stallard. How are you, Roy? Oh, okay, Andy. Good to meet you and the opportunity to give a bit more information. Yeah, good, good. Well, we first met, I think, to give people a bit of context. Uh, well, we first met at the Penn History Fair to give a sort of a bit of background about what you, you do. Uh, you were involved in New Cross Hospital setting up a, a museum or, yes. or something along those lines. Am I, am I completely on the wrong track? Or? No, you, you, you're completely there. It originated, actually to uh, open the museum at the Royal. But unfortunately, with the demise of Tesco, it all fell through and we were left holding the baby, trying to sh have establish a museum somewhere. And lo and behold, uh, the Trust Board at New Cross had a meeting in May and it was put to them and they said, no, they'd be happy to establish the museum on their premises so now we're at a situation where it's halfway there in the library of the postgraduate education center we've got two, two display units up and running and one will go in in this coming week so originally for the royal now it's at new cross and they're all delighted with the initial bits and pieces and is this because uh, you mentioned it's in the the graduate training area, is so is this something that that anybody can visit, or is it is it just for the medical professional? No, no, no. That's one thing that we've stressed is the opportunity for people to go and view the items, and they've assured me that as long as they go in and register at the desk and say what they're about, that'll be opportune. On odd occasions, it might not be possible. You know, there might be actually something physically going on in there. But in the vast bulk of time, people will be able to walk in and just have a look around. Okay. And what, so to give people a little teaser, what, what kind of things might they find in there? Oh, well, the more I think about it, we've got a huge range of products, uh, of bastards, uh, that we used in early Victorian medicine. Uh, we've got all sorts of devices that were used for respiration. The other thing is, I should say, the very early introduction of ether as an anaesthetic, and this is recorded with the third use of ether, took place in the public dispensary in Wolverhampton. Uh, in Queen Street, and we've got ether bottles uh, uh, and masks of that period. Um, uh, we've got a whole range of items that people bought and gave. We've got a set of postage stamps that the hospital sold in the 20s to raise money. Uh, we've got a uh, whole phalanx of different items, surgical items, medical items. So I think it'll be opportune and interesting for people to go and see. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, certainly I think there's there's an attitude amongst people that there's there's not a lot to do in Wolverhampton. So I certainly think anything that people can get themselves along to and, you know, certainly if they haven't got to pay either to get in there, that's always a, always a positive in uh, most people's eyes. Um, I mean, just by, uh, from the things you mentioned, one thing I should mention, a lot of people don't realise um, the dispensary that people talk about yeah. um, is actually, it's still there. A lot of people lament that most of the buildings of Wolverhampton have disappeared. Um, the It's not what it once was, obviously. It is now the restaurant known as Johnny Spice. Uh, but if you ever pass that in Queen Street, um, in fact, if you pass most of the buildings in Queen Street, they're still their original buildings. I mean, the, there's certainly some that are missing, like the church, but most of them are still 
although serving different purposes, still the building. And the dispensary is one of those that is still there. It's a good point that you make, Andy. When I'm asked about this, I say, people, put your bum. There's, there's a, a shop, uh, uh, an animal shop, uh, almost opposite uh, there. If you put your bum against the shop and look across and look up at this building, you'll find there's still some sort of porticos. The other interesting thing, of course, with that building is on the ground floor there was a firm of solicitors. It's still a firm of solicitors. And in the early days, they were called Shelton's. Now, in Shelton's, in their office, they've got a little plaque on the desk. They're delighted for people to just to look at it. And on the plaque, it tells you that when the public dispensary was closed in 1848, 47, 48, the good folk that were running it, charitable folk, said, we can't just destroy 30-odd beds. We must use it for orphanage purposes. At that particular moment, there were a lot of children, orphans in Wolverhampton. And so the public dispensary was the forerunner to the orphanage, the Royal Orphanage School on the Pen Road. Yeah, because I think that's a lot of people don't realise that about the, the Royal School either. Like people, particularly in my generation, just know it as the, the sort of posh school on the Pen Road. Yeah. But it, it was a, an orphanage, particularly, as you say, back in Victorian times, orphanage, orphans were a very common thing because of the the unsanitary conditions and things like that, weren't they? So Awful. I mean, if you look at the death toll in Wolverhampton then, people weren't living much beyond their 30s, really, you know. That was the age. And imagine some of them had got young children as well. So suddenly all these children were left. And and so these these good folk converted that public dispensary to begin life as an orphanage, orphanage school. Excellent, wasn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. and no, I was going to say, I mean, I know uh, I speak to Billy Howe a lot, and he talks about, um, there was one particular person who worked there by the name of Dr. James Gatiss. I don't know whether you've encountered yeah. if he was a, a surgeon. Yeah. There are buildings known as the Gatiss Community Space, which a lot of people don't realise are named after him. Um, but he did a lot for the, the town and, um, he unfortunately never lived long enough to the point where the Artisans Dwelling Act came in and a lot of these slum areas like Caribbean Island and places like that that all got demolished he never lived to the point where he saw all of this and all the you know open sewers in the road because it, it's it's difficult to sort of imagine quite how how unsanitary things like the road were it was just like an open cesspit essentially where people yeah. just you know, did whatever they did into the road and, you know, threw out animal remains and all this kind of stuff, didn't of they? Of course. And and conditions like typhoid and paratyphoid and all these other smallpox, they, they were all around the, the area, you know. And the, the wonder is, of course, is what you were saying. Open sewers were leading to it, you know. The other great medical name that should be mentioned is a man called Coleman. Coleman was the first appointed surgeon to the public dispensary. And Coleman did the third, used the third use of ether in the UK at the pub, well, uh, in Queen Street, there's a doctor's surgery. And he was called there from the public dispensary, only about 100 yards away. And Dr. Coleman amputated a femur a young girl that had been under a cart. And she was then taken from the surgery to be nursed in the public dispensary. She lived and she went home. That's not the end of the story, because about three years ago, out of the blue one afternoon, like today, we're sat talking, the phone rang and I answered it. And the voice said, is that Roy Stallard? I said, it is. And she said, well, I'm Professor Anthea Boylston. Anthea, she said. 
And she said, I'm an archaeological osteologist. Oh, I thought she looks at bones. She said, yes, and I just want to pick your brain, she said. Where would surgery have been done in Wolverhampton before the Royal Hospital developed? And I said, well, for example, uh, Queen Street Public Dispensary. Uh, and I said to her, there's a very interesting case of a young girl that was used ether early. She stopped me. She said, Eureka! She said, you've answered what I was going to ask you. Because she said, you know, we've had a dig in Wolverhampton at St. Peter's Cemetery, and I've been involved in looking at the dig and, and looking at the bones. And in a coffin of a man that had died with syphilis, I found an amputated femur. So I looked at that. She said, I sexed it, and there's a big difference between a female male bone and a male bone. She said, I've sexed it and I've aged it and dated it. I knew when it was put in the coffin remnant. And she said, now you tell me that the story's complete. And um, two or three months later, there was a paper published in the British Journal of Archaeology quoting exactly that. I've been in touch with her since. She's now retired. She was in Bradford, of course, at the university there. She's now living in the Cotswolds. And I had reason to speak to her a few months ago. And uh, she got back to me, or I got back to her. Uh, but uh, it's a fascinating story. And it really puts Wolverhampton on the medical map. The article, I believe, was published in The Lancet. So uh, we were really put on the medical map by the public dispensary, as you said. Uh, and bear in mind it opened with six beds and by the 1840s it had got 30 beds and it had almost got an A&E department in Castle Street at the back there. But then, of course, those go good folk that had been uh, paying for the public dispensary turned their money into converting to a proper hospital, which became the Royal. It's important to sort of remember that at those times, because a lot of people have grown up in an era where the NHS was in existence, and it, it it's so strange to think of growing up in a time when, you know, if, if you were run over by a cart, like you were saying, for example, there was, you know, you, you couldn't just pop along to the publicly funded hospital you uh, were reliant on this this hospital being paid for by you know the more well-off members of society and things like that. The idea of the public dispensary, in fact, was to be able to offer poor people who couldn't afford medicine treatment. And that's how it began life in Queen Street, and that's what happened to it. Of course, as they progressed, and they built more hospitals, they needed more money. So there was a charging system. But if people hadn't got the money, they were still treated. I think there's an Hippocratic Oath that doctors undergo that they have to treat. And that's what happened in Wolverhampton, basically. If they couldn't afford it or couldn't afford to give anything, they actually were treated. And uh, many doctors, they weren't all mercenary. <laughs> <laughs> initially uh, with the Royal, which was initially the Staffordshire General Infirmary, and then it became known as the Wolverhampton General Hospital. And then in the 20s, of course, it was given royal patronage. So the Royal opened its doors to a wide area of medicine. But the medicine was becoming more specialised and other cities, particularly large cities, were establishing infirmaries for the treatment of eye injuries and for the treatment of women and ladies, ladies' diseases. So we made progress from the Royal, initially into the eye infirmary. Uh, there was a GP in Piper's Row that had an interest in eyes, so people went there, but then these good people got together again and provided an eye infirmary 
in St Mark's Road, opposite St Mark's Church. And if you look at industry, people weren't wearing, they couldn't afford glasses. So there were no industrial care taken. People got things in their eye quite easily from factories, machines, from railway trains, from smoky chimneys. So eye conditions, also a bit strong association with eye conditions was measles. Uh, children who got measles, many of them got secondary eye infections, very common. In fact, my own son got blephritis, inflammation of the lid margins. And uh, so eye problems were huge, particularly in a developing industrial town. So we opened an eye infirmary uh, in uh, 1881. So I, I'm a diabetic and I have problems with my eyes yeah. and I go to, it's now at New Cross yeah. um, and in there there's a big poster on the back that's got a picture of the old eye infirmary yeah. uh, in sort of Chapel Ash area yeah. and it's got 1881 to eight, uh, 1981 so it must have been marking their 100 years and oh, yes. yeah. um, I st still remember that that the place was open until because I lived on Larch's Lane until. Did you really? Yeah. Just almost opposite. Yeah, yeah. So I would come out and I'd see all the taxis waiting out the front for people, and it, that seems even to me that seems like a lifetime ago because it's been closed. What is it? Probably ten years. Yeah, about now? about ten. Yeah. 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 So. Um, and to a lot of people, particularly younger people growing up, all they'll see now is just a, a big grand shell of the building, but not really have any clue what it was. I, I think it'll come down itself. The uh, As far as I'm aware, the high firm is not listed, but it's of great historical significance. Yeah. Now, whether that'll mean that the, the original building, because the nurses are next door, was only built in the twenties, but the whether the original building will survive, uh, we shall see. But it's a, it's a very nice piece of real estate, and the gardens were actually superb, and were well used. I mean, uh, in in both world wars, it was used uh, for the treatment of eye wounded soldiers, and the the gr grounds, the gardens were ideal in the summer months to sit in, yeah. Oh, it's a, a beautiful old building. It's, a, it's a, just a shame that, that nothing's happened. I, I was under the impression they were going to, in a fairly typical Wolverhampton fashion, turn it into luxury apartments, but I don't know how far they got with that procedure or process. I think I think that might well have gone. I have heard recently it has been sold now. But I don't know what the developments. We know the development plans for the Royal, and that's apartments. Right. And uh, I think we're hoping that come the new financial year in April, they might make a start on the Royal. So, uh, that, sorry, just I was going to clarify on that because I've long wondered what's happened to the Royal because I know, as you say, Tesco, we're going to buy it and turn it into a, a Tesco. Um, then. They, you know, there's a lot of de demolition work. Like John, the the chap we know lives nearby, he was saying uh, they could hear the um, them demolishing the was it the not the ultrasound the X-ray department yeah. with the really thick walls, and they had to bring in some brutal machinery. They could hear yeah. sort of rattling John's yeah. entire house, yeah. um, and then since then it, it's largely just been a completely derelict area of rubble. So, it, and I know they've. They've demolished another building, haven't they? Cleveland House. Yeah. And that house backed on to John Neve's house. Yeah. So John Neve would have been aware of the developments and, and as you say, the noise, etc. Because the Cleveland House was used for deep X-ray for yeah. oncology patients. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so, it, I mean... And have they put forward the plans for what they're doing with it? Do you know, or are you, are all they... I know is that uh, Jessops in Cannock have got the building 
for the purposes of converting it to apartments. We're on to them because um, I've got there as a picture. We've uh, subscribed to a blue plaque, which will be pinned on the front of the Royal Hospital. And I'm waiting now for Jessops to say, yeah, you can do it in the spring. I think we'll be happier then in pinning it when there's activity on the site. Yeah. I've got the picture there of the blue plaque that we're going to fit at the Royal. Um, because really, although it's cost a thousand pounds, which shook us rigid, the big one, that one, yeah. That's the, uh, that's been made now, that blue plaque, and uh, that's it. And that's it. Look, it'll look very nice, won't it? I'll, uh, I'll upload an image of this for uh, the people who aren't here, obviously. But yeah, uh, basically 1849 to 1997, yeah. Wolverhampton Royal Hospital, in recognition of the remarkable legacy of care by dedicated doctors, nurses, and ancillary staff. Uh, and that's from the trustees of the Wolverhampton Nurses League. What happened? Uh, this we had a little money, residual money left over from the Royal Hus original Royal Hospital Nurses League, and uh, the last throw of the dice was decided to ensure that that black, blue plaque goes on the wall of the Royal, which we're hoping to get completed this year, and. Uh, who, who better than Sir Stephen Moss to come and put it, uh, unveil it? Stephen trained at the Royal yeah. and worked there, also at the Iron Firmary. Mm -hmm. His career was a little bit like mine, if you like, but I didn't get a serdum. Stephen did, yeah. and uh, S Stephen will come and unveil that plaque. Can I just move on now, yeah. Andy? Yeah. Because yeah. We, we, we mentioned the problems with eye care, the other area that was concerning the Victorians was female medicine and the opportunity to embrace female medicine associated with obstetrics or childbirth. Yeah. You had an area called gynaecology yeah. and they fitted well together. So big cities, there was certain Liverpool had one and London, of course, and hospitals for women, and Wolverhampton followed fairly rapidly and established a hospital for women. If I can just take you back to Sainsbury's, you know, Sainsbury's, uh, the original Sainsbury's that was on the site of St George's. Opposite there, there's a veterinary practice. It's still there today. Chamberlain and, uh, who was Franklin and Chamberlain. And it had been said to me, you know, that was the original women's hospital. So I, I, I thought I'll research this. And Mr. Chambers, the son of the original veterinary practice, himself a vet, yeah. was still around at 92. Right. So I spoke to him and I said, can you help me? Uh, you know, it's been suggested that the veterinary practice uh, that you worked and your father established was a hospital. He said, I'll tell you what I know. My father bought that veterinary practice for one reason. It had got an operating theatre in it. He said, he got stables as well, he got a big yard. But the important thing for my father, it had got an operating theatre. And my father then bought that and established it as a veterinary practice and the theatre was used for the animals. Yeah. And we, we, we clicked it then. And uh, the veterinary practice there was the original site for a women's hospital in Wolverhampton. Again, demand was enormous. It was a growing city, a growing town. And... Um, it wasn't big enough, and that coincided with that movement because the eye infirmary wasn't big enough, and they were building a new one in Compton Road, only a few hundred yards away from St Mark's. 
and so the uh, eye infirmary became vacant. So they moved from the All Saints site down to St. Mark's Road. And um, again, time overtook it. And by the beginning of the 20th century, in 1900, it wasn't big enough itself. And so they established, they built a hospital for women in Connaught Road by West Park. So by then, we'd got three hospitals established. The other one I didn't mention, which echoed at about the same time as the eye infirmary, was the Fever Hospital, or Parkfield Hospital, as it became known. That was on Parkfield Road, back of Parkfield Road, Birmingham New Road, and it became the Isolation Hospital. As I said earlier, there was a huge manifestation of, of, of diseases associated with hygiene, public health, polio, all the diarrhoea problems and all of that. So this demand for specialist infective diseases care was assured at, at Parfields. It's, it's a good question, Andy, and I'm frequently asked that, but I, 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 I hope to solve it myself. In as much a few years ago, there was a great interest in the Jewish cemetery uh, in Wolverhampton. There is, yeah. I've got interest in that, but that's another story. Uh, yes, of course. And uh, this is where we miss my good friend who, who went up to Hill. But uh, nonetheless, that Jewish cemetery is directly opposite what is now a little new housing estate, yeah, yeah, yeah. which housed the Fever Hospital, Parkfield Hospital. It's funny, when I was a boy, I was brought up in Springfields, and I remember as a boy, the ambulances would call and take away children and take them to the Fever Hospital. And uh, so that, that's got an interesting history. There's a plaque left behind, right. uh, but uh, not much else. Okay. I was, I was going to say, because I, I, the Jewish cemetery is something that, that interests me uh, particularly, because um, not a lot of people know it's there. Exactly. Uh, um, and it's not in the greatest of shape. Um, no, no, no. We did get a party up, admittedly, and uh, we went and cleaned up the, 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 the site. But the building itself that uh, housed the services uh, is now, it could well be down now, but that, that was suffering. Yeah. The O oh hell, I thought O oh hell, yes. however it's yes. pronounced. Yeah. yeah, because I've actually got um, a lot of the, the documentation around uh, the, like the structural engineer's report and stuff like that that was done about, Mm, we're in 2019 now, aren't we? Um, it's probably about six years ago, I think, and I know it was in quite a lot of trouble then. So yeah. it's something that, um, that particularly myself, I'm looking at maybe trying to get something where we can try and get some funding to get it done up. So. I, I think that would be a wonderful move. Um, I was talking to somebody fairly recently about that, and she did say that the, she knew the Jewish Board of Governors had been involved and they'd actually been down here. I think there's about a hundred grave spots. The other feature is, of course, we mustn't forget uh, the Jewish community were always very valuable throughout the year to the hospitals. But at Christmas time, and when I went to the Royal in the 1954, at Christmas time in the kitchens, you got a, a large cadre of Jewish people who obviously weren't recognising Christmas like us Gentiles. Yeah. And uh, they gave up their time voluntary to assist in the kitchens so the kitchen staff themselves could have a bit of free time with their families. So the Jewish community, with due respect, have made a huge charitable contribution yeah. to Wolverhampton. And as you indicate, Andy, 
it should be recognised. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, no, it's definitely one of our our list of um, projects. I think that we we want to consider. I'm not saying we we we're gonna. We've got obviously quite a lot of things, you know, that require attention and need saving and things like that. But it's one um, from a personal perspective that really interests me. And um, I know when I've brought the subject up on Facebook when discussions about park fields in that area have come up, the amount of people who A, don't know about it, and then B, when they know about it, are fascinated by it, uh, is, is astonishing. So, But um, it's interesting that you... Uh, so you, I think one of the things you touched on there was um, about the fever hospital and being about a boy. Um, so... Th- what I wanted to, to, to do with this interview is not just talk about Wolverhampton and its hospitals, obviously, was to talk about you yourself, um, because obviously you've got a lot of memories of Wolverhampton that, you know, people of my age and, and uh, you know, a little bit older aren't, aren't going to have. So um, you mentioned you grew up in Springfield yeah. area. So. By, by, by Butler's Brewery. Uh, my father was a railway man and uh, I was brought up. There's a garage on the Cannock Road now. Opposite, there was a pub. It's a Polish shop now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, prior to that, it was a pub called The Wagon and Horses. And right opposite there in the garage was the house. I was brought up there. Actually, one of 11 children, can you believe? My my father was a, was a railway man and worked for the LMS. But he was an inveterate producer of children. Um and obviously, I went to St. Stephen's School. I've got a potted history there. I wrote about St. Stephen's School when the church celebrated its centenary. Because, of course, I was an active member of St. Stephen's Church. I still am to some, a bit more limited now. So I went to school at St. Stephen's. I actually passed for the grammar school. But because the clothing expense requirements couldn't be satisfied by a royal women's salary, I went to Springfield Road Schools, which was a secondary modern school. So my place at the grammar school had been sacrificed, and yet there existed in Wolverhampton a charitable uh, setup that would provide extra clothes for children who went to the grammar school whose parents couldn't afford it. But nonetheless, I had a very good secondary modern education at Springfield Road. And during the next three years, I worked as in Baker's Nurseries in the Landscape Department. And then I was called up for national service. What year roughly would this have been? Sorry. I went to the Royal... I went to National Service in 1952. But about a year prior to that, I'd actually been into the Royal... I was nursed in the Royal. I had paratyphoid fever. And I met male nurses for the first time, and it interested me. So when I came up for National Service, I made a request. Could I go in the Royal Army Medical Corps? which I did, because when people were called for national service, I think they were put in the infantry or put in what they decided. Fortunately for me, I was drafted into the RAMC. And that, for me, my whole substance of life altered. In two years in a military hospital in Germany, I'd become a nursing orderly. I became a nursing order class one, which they told me at the time was quite something. And, of course, then at the end of that, I'd written to the matron at the Royal and said, could you find me a job? I'm coming out of the army as a nursing orderly. So I came home. I went to see her and she said, well, this your record looks very good. Why don't you train to be a nurse? So you can work for a, as a nursing orderly for a few months until the school proper starts and you can train to be a nurse. And that was it. So in 1954, I joined the nurse training school at the Royal. And there I continued then. And uh, 
became a staff nurse. And in those days, you know, male nurses were treated a little bit like lady priests today. We were, males were treated in a little bit. We were second-class citizens. Opportunities for male nurses in general nursing were very limited and you needed to get another diploma. So having served as a staff nurse, I then went to the eye infirmary to do an eye diploma. So I then got an SRN and an OND. Ah, now I know what they mean. Yeah, yeah. and I got a rapid promotion at the eye. I became, I know people are still fascinated, I became uh, the female's ward sister. <laughs> in charge of the female medical ward. Uh, Matron Jones was quite far-seeing, and she liked men. <laughs> and uh, so I got I did a job as a night sister there and as a ward sister. And then I was living in Clarendon Street in a flat, and somebody came down from the Royal Hospital to see me and said, Matron would like to see you back at the Royal, and there's a job if you'd like one in the nursing school so uh, obviously that was very attractive to me to go back to my original so i went to see her and she said i can offer you a job as an assistant nurse tutor in the nursing school and there he went on woods and upwards it was an excellent excellent job and i then became president the first male president of the hospital nurses league you know it was a social charitable organization i must add as well towards the end of my nursing career someone offered me a job it was just the beginning of what they call the blockbuster drugs the clock buster drugs yeah. and somebody said we think with your background you could go and talk about these new drugs that can be used to break clots down, particularly in the heart for problems. And uh, they said, we think you could find a career. So towards the end of my nursing career, which I never lost and never failed to love, I went, did some work for a pharmaceutical company. And I was then seeing people who I'd, I'd spoken and knew well. And then, of course, the Nurses League sadly folded, although the new one is set up. Uh, and uh, it's as a result of that league that we've been able to afford the blue plaque. Yeah, that's, it's, a, it's a beautiful tribute to them. And, yeah. Uh... I've got a few things, Andy, mm. if you'd like to borrow them, yeah, yeah, which certainly. you can take home yeah. with you. Um, that you'll find a fascinating historical ah, okay. look at it's the a, royal this is a history of the the royal hospital you're holding up yeah it does it does include just sketchily the others yeah and i also did subscribe to a book well i did it the book um there which we sold and um gave the proceeds half of the proceeds went to new cross to the chaplaincy and half went to my uh, former church in Springfield, St. Right. Stephen's. So I produced this little record of what we've been talking about, mm. the history and heritage of Wolverhampton hospitals. It will sound weird to you now, Roy, but it will make perfect sense to somebody who's watching this. And all the pictures you will have seen accompanying this will have been shots I will have taken from Roy's booklets so that will make a lot more sense um because it'd be nice to have some visuals to accom uh, accompany what we've been talking about um and yeah so that will all be fantastic to go with it um i yeah i mean i, I guess uh is there anything else you wanted to sort of get oh, across or oh, are you no just that i married a nurse <laughs> yeah <laughs> my wife and i trained together yeah, that's how you met uh, that's it? where we met at the royal um 1953, I think, 52, we, no, 54, for, uh, sorry. Mm. And we got married then in 58, and uh, here, here we've been since. 
Um, and during that time, of course, I've had very strong interest in the hospital structures, the changes, the criticisms, which I've made myself, um, certainly about nursing standards. Yeah. Of course, that's now behind me. Uh, that time relates to the Stafford Hospital Inquiry yeah, yeah. when nursing uh, cares were exposed. And uh, I was critical at that time myself. Mm. And what I must also say is I've been one of the advocates not for university training of nurses. I still believe where you should train nurses is, is I ask you, where do you train garage mechanics in a garage? Where should nurses be fully trained in a hospital? Largely, uh, it still is, but much of it is done in a university. And I can't marry the two. I'm still an advocate for nurse, hospital nurse training schools. You know, I'm not particularly qualified on this subject, but that would seem to make a lot of sense to me that if you're reading things out of a book, how are you ever going to get the same level of, you know, practical, that you, you can't replicate practical experience of something? What a good point you've made, Andy. What a very good point you've made, because a few years ago, a colleague of mine who had aspired at New Cross to being a, 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 a deputy matron, if you like, and she trained at the Royal, and she said, you know, Roy, now, these nurses that come out of university, they can't put a, a nasogastric tube down, she said, whereas all of us, we knew all of that, before we'd left the Royal, we'd done it, performed it. So it's a good point that the practical experiences are a little bit diluted to compare to our day, you know. I think, I mean, I do think that's, it's sort of common across a lot of things. Like my dad, uh, he did an apprenticeship um, and I know the government have tried doing a bit more in the way of apprenticeships and stuff recently, but a lot of that kind of, more learning on the job side of things seems to have been dispatched and i noticed because I, I mean i went to university i went to staffordshire um and i did and i did it largely because it was you've got uh, my and this is not a slight on my mom but she was like you need to go and get a degree and all this like you, you in modern world you need a degree yeah. and realistically I'm not convinced my degree got me any further than had I not got a degree. I did a degree in history and politics. I mean, I do stuff to do with history that I could have done without a degree in it. I don't want to be a politician. Realistically, I just ran a debt from university and I could have been, you know, learning something practical on the job as an apprentice. And so I do think there's definitely merit in, in that. And particularly with nursing on the job, you know, you're going to get all patients coming with all kinds of different conditions that, you know, you, you, you've got to sort of, it's not necessarily a case that it's obvious. Like in, in one of the common things I find with textbooks and things like that is here's a scenario that's really obvious but real life isn't like that. You might get something where somebody has multiple conditions and it's trying to decipher what is causing the actual problem, if that you know makes sense, I guess. It does make sense, and it makes even more sense to me. What I'm not doing, of course, is disclaiming Wolverhampton University, which is a, a most superb institute. Yeah, yeah. But if I looked wider... That is, if we just took midwifery alone, and there are huge problems in midwifery now and the background of the people that are coming into midwifery. Now, when I trained, and in those distant years, people did general nursing first, and a lot of them then went into midwifery. Today, as of, to, you, if whatever your background, you can become a midwife. And I think when you go into a situation, you need the background or should have had the background, the hospital background and that environment. And I think 
one of the problems, certainly in midwifery and gynae work, is the lack of background of many, practical background, I mean, in a hospital environment. And I think that could well be, who am I, that could well be a, a little problem associated with the current midwifery problems that look as though they're nationwide. And I think the background of the people. Who am I? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. And um, I'm sure you've got that many stories. We'll do this again sometime. Um, but yeah, until then, thank yeah. you for your time. Uh, Andy, just before you go, mm. uh, because I've got loads of stories. I told you the one about the bone. Mm. The other one I really should comment on was our former local Labour MT, a chap called Rob, Rob Maris. Yeah, yeah, Rob uh, Maris, yeah. Uh, Absolutely splendid uh, uh, Labour MP yeah, yeah. for South West Wolverhampton, which wasn't really Labour territory, but Rob got the seat. Now, I'd known Rob since he was a young lad. His father was a consultant at the Royal. He was a consultant radiologist. In essence, he read x-rays, his father. And I was on McLaren Ward, and we had a, a fella come in that had got a head injury, a fractured skull, and a bilateral fractured femur. Uh, both his femurs were broken. And the consultant at the time was a chap called Ernie Freeman, Mr. Freeman, well known. And he required x rays of the legs every two weeks. Chap was probably in about six to eight weeks anyway. So he had x rays done at regular intervals. And somehow his teeth, let's just call this bloke Bill. His teeth had been lost. Right, okay. And every time his wife came on afternoon or evening, she was very worried about Bill. But where the hell were his teeth? And what did we say? I was the staff nurse on there. I said, this, the, we've got to be the night staff. They've lost his teeth, etc." And his teeth weren't coming up at all. They'd gone. Bill went down for his check x-ray and... Rob Marish's father looked at the x-rays and then he'd put in a report and he'd say things like right leg shows some new both grown, gr growing new bone, uh, left leg a bit more stable. So he'd send a report back with the x-rays and Mr Freeman would look at them. And on this particular time, alongside the x-ray report was a, a note which said, also noted a pair of upper dentures. <laughs> and, and what Bill had done, of course, he'd got a scratch under his plaster uh, and he tried to reach it with his fingers, which he couldn't. So he'd got all of his teeth and had gone inside the plaster to try and ease the itch. And that is, so I always said to Rob Marish, your father was very humorous because he said to Freeman, Okay, the fractures look as though they're growing or improving, but there was a set of teeth there as well. <laughs> well, at least they didn't think his leg was growing teeth. No, we didn't laugh at Bill. We laughed with him. Mm. It was important then that you didn't laugh at patients, yeah. but you laughed with them, you know. His teeth were secured and back in his mouth by the weekend. So, <laughs> And laughter is the best medicine, as yeah, they say. Yeah, right. very good. Right. So right. thank you, Andy, for no, the no. opportunity. No, you know. no, uh, any time, any time. Um, but yeah, I think uh, hopefully um, people have uh, from around the world will have had a chance to listen because we had you along to the society's December talk. But we have a lot of uh, expatriates in Canada and Australia and America and everywhere who still have a fondness for Wolverhampton, and uh, hopefully um, there'll be a few people out there who will. Uh, you know, served in the, the nursing professions and things like that over the years. And hopefully we've brought back some memories for you. And if you've got any, please feel free to tell us and uh, we'll, we'll get in touch with Roy for you. Wonderful.